Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to Bookish. We're your virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life, brought to you from the Southern California News Group and the Bay Area News Group. I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of premium content at SCNG and a book nerd and author myself. I want to say thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers and to all of you who've made our virtual program so popular this last year. By the way, if you're a Reader Reward subscriber attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift card from Barnes & Noble. Also, you can get signed copies of books by today's authors from our new partner and one of our favorite independent bookstores in Los Angeles County, Once Upon a Time. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our bookish host. She's a writer, performer, and radio commentator, and you might know her work from NPR's Morning Edition and This American Life. She's a contributing editor to The Atlantic and host of the syndicated Radio Minute, The Lowdown on Science. She's the author of many books, her most recent being The Mad Woman and the Roomba, beaming to us from the bohemian splendor of Pasadena, please welcome my friend Sandra Singlo. Hey, Sandra, you there? Hello, it's great to see you. Hello. So what, well, we got, what, what do we got coming up? Okay, well, even though the pandemic is semi lifting, isn't it fun at Fridays at five? We're not in traffic, we're still in sweatpants. I'm not saying what I'm wearing below the waist. Um, so <laughs> to armchair travel, if you will. So, and today, Samantha, we have sort of a whirlwind tour around the world. So we're going to start in India, then wow. go to Los Angeles, perhaps into even to the Valley of Los Angeles, then to America, the Green Book Tour, and then to the interior of Chinatown. Oh my which is gosh. A place Maybe it isn't, maybe it is. We'll explore that. It's very complicated. I mean, well, it sounds, oh, go ahead. No, <laughs> we have a lot to get through, so. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we have a lot to get through. So I'm gonna get out of here, let you get started. Ciao, have fun. All right, we'll, we'll see you anon. Okay, so first up uh, on Bookish today, Elka Joshi, the 30 second download. Born in Jaipur, India, Elka Joshi has lived in the US since the age of nine. Okay, she has a BA from Stanford University and an MFA from the California College of the Arts. She ran her own advertising and PR agency for 30 years. And then, people, at 62, she publishes her first novel, and it's an instant literary sensation. We're talking uh, The Henna Artist, and it's a Reese Witherspoon book club pick, New York Times bestseller, and more. The mesmerizing sequel just out is The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. Welcome, Alka Joshi. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and thanks for everybody who's tuning in. Yes, absolutely. So if you could, before we get to these amazing books of yours, um, can you describe a little bit of that journey of your first novel coming out? I, I think that you enter an MFA program at 51. What was at that like? 51. <laughs> I know, you know, all my classmates were like 20 somethings and I'm sure what they were thinking is what is grandma doing in class <laughs> with all this gray hair? What was um, that like? I, yeah, really. So um, it, it was it was it was a little unnerving uh, because they all seem to have so much life in front of them. But I realized I had a lot of life behind me. And, you know, sometimes that gives you excellent fodder for writing, as you well know, having written so many books. And so, um, you know, I just thought at 51, it was time for me to do something a little bit different. And the recession was upon us and I had some downtime in my business. So I thought, you know what, let me go into that two year program and just immerse myself in learning how to write. And my husband had encouraged me to do it. So why not? So that's what I did. So, and this book is The Hannah Artist, your yes. first novel. And, and it sort of grew out of a question that came out of your personal life. Can you describe that? Yeah, the question was, what would my mother have done if she had been allowed to live a very different kind of life? My mother had a very conventional Indian upbringing. So she's married off at 18 uh, to my father, uh, whom she has never met before, never even said word one until wedding night. She has three kids within four years. She never has a career. She never gets to go back to college. And I felt that her life was never her own, but she allowed me to have an amazing life of my own, a very independent life in which I made all my own decisions. So I thought, 
you know, and what if I could thank her by giving her an alternate life in the character of Lakshmi, who becomes a henna artist and an herbalist, escapes a marriage she's not happy with, and completely goes off and forges her own path. Now, I, I love this idea. I, I think that these kind of women have always existed, and it was so fun for me to imagine my mother in this role uh, and living out this amazing life. And you wrote it, I think, over 10 years, right? And you shared some of it with your mother along the way. What did she think? What was that like? My mother was amused, first of all, that I had fashioned this main character after her. And she said, well, honey, two things. One is, you know, Lakshmi is a Brahmin like we are. My father would never have allowed me to become a henna artist. Why is it that Lakshmi is doing this henna art in 1955 India? So I said to her, mom, you know, I need for Lakshmi to be able to straddle all these different social classes because I want to show India in all of its iteration, uh, the wealthy, the middle class and the lower socioeconomic class. I want to show India and how all of these different classes are treating her post-independence. So uh, I need for Lakshmi to be able to straddle these classes. So what better than to have a high caste woman doing the work of a lower caste person? Now, of course, this is no longer true. You know, henna artists are everywhere and, and uh, you know, in all kinds of social classes. But back in 1955, that would have been uh, very uh, verboten. And then my mother also said, you've got Lakshmi doing this elaborate henna. She's painting wasps and, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, figs and all these things. Things. And she said, you know, when in 1955, when I was married, my henna was super crude. It was just painted on with a finger and you would have like a big circle with some dots around it. That's all you got to do. And I said, yeah, but mom, there's something called creative license. You know about this, Sandra, that you get to take as an author. And that means that you get to imbue your main characters with all kinds of characteristics that they may not have had. And, uh, you know, and I think the way you present India is, is so fascinating and it's it's fresh and it's also very relatable. And although it is very specific, uh, both of your books um, to Jaipur, uh, it, you, you get fans writing from all over the world, right? It, it's not uh, like... Uh, from from everywhere relating to this story, I think about women, right, who, who are maybe kind of experiencing you know, some constriction in terms of what they're allowed in their lives and moving beyond that. Why do you think that's so? This has come as such a surprise to me. I wrote this novel for my mother, and I had no idea that her life or her imagined life would resonate with all of these women around the world. But the henna artist was translated into 23 languages. And I hear from everybody in every language telling me that they can relate to this story. They not only understand uh, Lakshmi's dilemma as a woman and all of the obstacles that she faces in her life, but they also understand her on this very fundamental level of uh, the patriarchy and how women have uh, granted some agency in this world. Sometimes they are granted more, sometimes they're granted less. How do all of these women deal with that loss of agency. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been such an amazing ride. You know, during this past year, when people have felt so isolated and hopeless during the pandemic, I have felt so connected to people. I have talked to over 550 book clubs. I have spoken to so many uh, different people around the world, literary conferences and so on. And I think this is the beauty re really of virtual events. Just like you said, you know, we are allowed to um, look fabulous from the waist on up. <laughs> Who knows what we're doing down there <laughs> below, but you know, we have this amazing ability uh, to be able to talk to people all around the world in all these different time zones. And so I have felt immediately connected to so many people, 6,000 people across the world because of writing these books. And can you give a teaser for the third in the third book in the trilogy? That I can, I can. So if the henna artist is 1955 and Lakshmi, our henna artist, has just met her 13-year-old sister and uh, she is running around with her helper, eight-year-old Malik, who, who is a street urchin, then the secret, secret keeper of Jaipur is about Malik and Lakshmi 12 years later. Malik is 20 years old and a polished young man. And then the third book is about Radha, her sister, who is now 
about the same age that Lakshmi was when she had to incorporate a little sister into her life. So in the third book, uh, Radha is living in Paris. She is married to a Parisian. She has two children. She is a perfumer working in this fragrance lab. Uh, who, who doesn't like perfume? So I'm doing all this research on perfume and it's just amazing. And uh, at, there's a knock on her door and somebody she hasn't seen in 18 years and never hoped to see again is on the other side of that door. So that's what's happening in book number three, along with Radha designing a signature scent that is going to become uh, her, uh, her big contribution to this world. And one more quick question. I mean, the time is so short, but you do a lot of teaching of, of writing and in master classes. I mean, is there what it, it can seem so overwhelming to people of writing and marketing, et cetera. Is there like one piece of advice that you would give those watching now? Yeah. First of all, uh, I think that you have to know that writing is about rewriting. You have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. It took me 30 drafts to do The Henna Artist, 12 drafts to do The Secret Keeper. And I imagine it's going to take me 15 drafts to do the third book. So uh, you just have to be prepared for that. Secondly, you have to know that you have something to contribute to this world. Why are you writing this story? Why you? Why now? And you have to know the answers to those questions in order to produce a manuscript that is uh, going to to resonate with the world, uh, where everybody's going to say, oh, this is a story I haven't heard before, because it is really coming from your interior. So I think that is really important. And then I think a third thing is, you're never too old to write. So um, I have heard from so many people around the world who say, you know what, I'm 60, I'm 65, I'm 70. Look at you. You have just published your first novel at 62. I think I can do it too. And you know, if I can provide that kind of uh, comfort and inspiration to people, I am happy as a clam. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Alka Joshi. The time is too short. Her newest book, the sequel to The Henna Artist, is The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Lovely to be with you. A pleasure. Next up, Matthew Spector, The 30 Second Download. Matthew Spector's books include the novels the Sum That Summertime Sound and American Dream Machine, which was long listed for the Folio Prize, and The Golden Hour, which is forthcoming from Echo Press. Born in Los Angeles, he received his BA from Hampshire College in 1988, his MFA in Creative Writing from Warren Wilson College in 2009. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, GQ, Paris Review, Tin House, Black Clock, and numerous other periodicals. He's a founding editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. His new memoir in criticism, that's the phrase, just out from Tin Houses, always crashing in the same car on art crisis in Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, Sandra. Thank you for having me. Oh, what a pleasure. Okay, so your prose says it all. So let's begin with one of your truly memorable sentences. And I'm going to say it as a some time ago, this is in parens and in quotes, in my younger and more vulnerable years, I suffered a kind of crash. Can you elucidate? Can I elaborate on that? <laughs> yes, um, a, a metaphorical crash, not, not in this case a vehicular crash. Um, I, you know, I, I suppose um, that, that parenthetical quote there in my younger and more vulnerable years is of course the, the opening sentence of the, the Great Gatsby um, or part of the opening sentence of The Great Gatsby. Um, and the first chapter of this book revolves around F. Scott Fitzgerald, but it also revolves around a sort of series of, of, of midlife events, a, 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 um, a ruptured marriage, uh, some child custody issues, a, a um, uh, sort of lost professional period. I, I had been working as a screenwriter and the, the Writers Guild of America went on strike at the time. So I was suddenly um, jobless. Uh, my my mother was was very ill and dying, and she and I had had a, a kind of very tendentious relationship. So it was it was a sort of perfect storm of of, of middle age trouble. That's that's the that's the crash being described in this case. Yeah, and I think that you are, you talk about Los Angeles, and I'm a native of Los Angeles as well. <clears throat> I think you've talked about people's view of Los Angeles, yeah. which can be sort of stereotypical, and then your your version of it so can you say what you think people think los angeles is and then what you think yes i think that when, when i I'm, I'm i'm old enough to have grown up in in a time when los angeles was still considered a cultural desert um of some kind and uh you know and and, and i think that 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 misconception has fortunately 
um, destroyed itself pretty pretty comprehensively. But but certainly back in the '80s, there was this idea of you know Los Angeles was a very was was you know considered a shallow pond, which you know anybody who who actually lives here, I mean there are aspects of it that are that way, right? I mean you know and then there always have been. Um, but I think um, you know it was it was interesting to me that, that here I was in the middle of it in a family that you know was was fairly arts oriented um, and I still felt that way I thought my god you know if, if I want to be an artist or, or even if I just want to have a um, a thoughtful life I need to leave and um, you know I, I kind of figured out once I had left that uh, that it wasn't LA that was the problem it was uh, it was uh, being a teenager <laughs> <laughs> well and you said failure is the secret story of Los Angeles well so yeah, I mean, I mean, what, what, what uh, did I say that? <laughs> well, it's been, it's been said about you. Okay. What, what I would say is, is that, is that, um, you know, this, this book, I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, I, I am interested in the lives of artists um, and I am, I am interested in the, the struggles of artists, which, which I think are, are um, not necessarily unique to artists. You know, this book revolves around both a period in my life where I felt um, somewhat at sixes and sevens and, you know, couldn't really, um, you know, was was struggling was was struggling with questions of work and questions of career and questions of you know what does it mean to be successful, and you know anybody who who uh, writes books. I mean, I think Alka was very, um, you know, when when she talked about about you know starting to write late, um, which by the way isn't that late. I mean, you know, I I, I didn't I didn't publish a, a book until I was in my forties, and um, but I had started writing quite a lot earlier, and and so you know the book was sort of. On the one hand, you know, my narrative in it is it's it's about you know me interrogating my own feelings of failure, but but hopefully I think you know these feelings are are things that people who who people might understand or experience whether they're artists or not. You know, I, I think I think everybody has 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 that experience of feeling like oh I'm not where I want to be in my life, or you know I thought my life would look different at this point. Um, and and it's interesting, you know, tracing from Alka, she kind of redoes her mother's story, if you will. And you said, and you do, you, you say, my mother was a failure, if that's how you care to view it. So how did you work out your feelings with your mother in the story with Carol Eastman? You know, my mother was a, a that's a, that sounds very, um, sounds pretty rough, you know, sort of stripped of context. But yes, my mother was a, was a, was a screenwriter um, who wrote one movie um, that didn't come out all that well. Um, and then she was kind of blackballed from from the Writers Guild, and she and she she quit the business. Um, and um, the reasons for that are are multiple. Some of them were some of the reasons were personal, um, which is to say, you know, she had problems with alcohol and with substances. But some of the reasons I think were also um, structural, in that I think that Hollywood has not always been a particularly hospitable place for for uh, for women, and uh, particularly for women artists. And I think a lot of very very talented writers and filmmakers in the, in the 70s were often sort of eclipsed by their by their male pick by their masculine counterparts um, and so part of kind of coming to grips with my mother's narrative was coming to understand that even if I had experienced her as an alcoholic or as a difficult parent there was so much more to her story than than that you know and, and I think that anybody who has who's ever had a, a difficult parent eventually realizes that the difficult you know what what we experience as total right they're kind of you know when you're younger and you sort of go oh you know my parent was abusive and then you realize oh like my parent was many 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 other things besides that many of them and and many of them quite wonderful um so you know it was it was a, a very exciting and and wonderful for me to kind of explore my mom's life outside the context the, the narrow context of of her being a parent and I think even though, you know, you can say this, this is a book about Los Angeles, midlife, some failure, et cetera, it's really fun to read. And it's, it's a delight. And I think that the joy in reading your work is that you, you love to read. And I, I love the passage about the Iliad bookshop in uh, the valley, which is yeah. so great. And if, if I can just quote this, Iliad is the quintessential used bookshop, worrying fans, torpid cats, that silence punctuated by throat clearings, coughs, the occasional squeak of a footstep to which readers and collectors stalk their prey. The silence is largely faded from Los Angeles. So, um, so is, is the joy of reading partly 
link to the joy of writing for you? Of course, of course, of course, of course. I mean, I, I am I am definitely a writer who loves writing. Um, you know, there are there are times when it there are there are moments where it gets a little laborious, but it is it is a source of great joy. And if I'm not enjoying what I'm writing, if it does not strike me as fun, then it will probably not be any fun to to read. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, there is a, there is this set for all this book, you know, kind of frames itself as a book about failure. It was an absolute blast to write. And, you know, there, there is a, there is, a, I hope, a, a joy and a, a, you know, some humor and, and things that kind of come through it, um, you know, above and beyond all that. Um, but yeah, of course, it all comes from being a reader, you know, I mean, it's from, from being a, a, an obsessive uh, reader order of books. Uh, I, I loved writing that passage about Iliad books too, because it's such a it's such an incredible store. Um, you know, it really it has a, a, a just a timeless feel. You know, an, an archival feel. And, no, and it's so fun reading about all the the um, not failures exactly, but people who whose careers didn't quite explode in a certain in in a certain way. But it is fascinating reading. I mean, Eve Babbitt's is a uh, it, it, you don't devote an entire chapter to her, but I think for those, just to tease those new to your book, new yeah. to under, understanding Los Angeles, can you can you sum up like uh, with Eve Babbitt's why she was so fun and what what her life was? Like? Absolutely, and I would say writing. I, I I was asked a few years ago to write an introduction to Evie's um, Slow Days Fast Company when it came back into print, and it was writing that that actually I had so much fun writing that that I thought God I need to be doing more. More, more criticism, more writing about other writers. So, and, and you know, that played into this book. But I think Eve Babbitts was the writer who, for me, made it okay to write about Los Angeles with, with joy. I think, you know, Babbitts was, of course, Joan Didion's contemporary. Joan Didion is, is you know, heaven, heaven on a stick. She is the most wonderful writer. But her view of Los Angeles can be a little, can be a little acerbic. And, uh, and, and Babbitts is someone who was Didion's generational contemporary who you know, embraced the hedonistic relationships, the, the hedonistic aspects of this city, particularly in the 70s, and didn't, and didn't consider that in conflict with being a serious person. You know, if, you read her, if you read Slow Days Past Company, she's writing about Quaaludes and she's writing about Proust. Um, you know, and, and you get the sense that, oh, you know, so, someone can write with, with a kind of sense of champagne style and champagne joy and, 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 and also be a, a serious artist. And that, that too, is a really lovely, lovely thing to discover. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Matthew Specker. Again, time is too short, yes. um, and it's a delight to read your his new memoir in criticism. Always crashing the same car. You know, a reference to the David Bowie song, I believe, on Art Crisis in Los Angeles, California, just out on Tin House Press. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, Gretchen Soren, the thirty-second download. Gretchen Soren is director and distinguished service professor at the Cooperstown Graduate Program, a training program for museum curators, educators, and directors, part of the State University of New York College at Oneonta. I think I said that correctly, perhaps not. Dr. Soren's books include Touring Historic Harlem, Four Walks in Northern Manhattan with architectural historian Andrew Dolcourt, In the Spirit of Martin, The Living Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., through the eyes of others, African Americans and identity in American art and case studies in cultural entrepreneurship. Uh, she is uh, the, the author of the newest, the newest book is Driving While Black, African American Travel on the Road to Civil Rights with filmmaker Rick Burns. It became a documentary film on PBS just out in October. Uh, welcome Gretchen Soren from the East Coast. <laughs> Hi, Sandra. Thanks so much. <laughs> and, and like I said before, I, 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 I'm praying that's not your actual office because it looks really cool. I hope it's a backdrop. But It's my actual office. And you said Oneonta correctly. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, after J4, it's like, okay. So can you tell us a little bit about how, how the idea for your book came to you? Um, I, I actually started the book um, as a dissertation, I um, went back to school as did Elka and uh, for my PhD. And I was working on an exhibition in Saratoga Springs, New York. Saratoga is a resort community and African-Americans used to um, 
used to vacation there. And I was doing some research for this exhibition and a colleague handed me, and this is about 20 years ago before the Green Book movie, before anybody had ever heard of the Green Book. And I was handed a cover from an old Green Book and I never heard of it. Right, and, and for those and who parents, don't know, the, the few who might know, like, can you say what the Green Book was? Well, the Green Book was a little travel guide that African-Americans used in Jim Crow America to list hotels and motels and restaurants and beauty parlors and barber shops, road houses, places that would welcome black travelers. Well, I was, um, you know, I, I was stunned that this was within my lifetime and I never heard of it. My parents never mentioned it. Um, and so I was just curious and that it really got started because I was curious. And I, I, so, it, it's a fascinating book and the theme of mobility is interesting when African-Americans kind of like public transportation could be fraught. So the automobile gave freedom in, in, a, in a fascinating way. But I think it's great reading because it's interwoven with your own stories of growing up. So could you just sort of relate a family, what a family <laughs> trip was like from Newark to Fayetteville? Well, I, I should say that at my first impression when I started doing this, I was a dispassionate historian and this had nothing to do with me. I was convinced. And as I did the research, it, it, it kind of crept up on me that this was my story and this was my parents' experience. And so I started to remember and think about family stories. And so I, I decided that I really needed to integrate them into the book. And so each chapter starts with a personal story. Um, and I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, um, but my mother was from Fayetteville, North Carolina. And every summer we would go back to Fayetteville to visit my mother's family. Um, and I, I grew up in this very integrated, part Jewish, part African-American, part Indian, part Latino, is a very, very mixed neighborhood. And I just thought everybody lived like that. But when we went to North Carolina, it was an all black community. And we would uh, get up really, really early in the morning and load the car with food and blankets and pillows. And I always thought it was to make us very comfortable. And my research showed me that it was really because we couldn't stop. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't stop at a motel. We couldn't stop at a restaurant. They were segregated. Um, and we would drive straight through to North Carolina, starting out in the dark, because of course you're less likely to be stopped by the police if they can't see who's in the car. And African-Americans traditionally would drive at night or in the dark, which was something that um, parents never really talked about. They wanted to protect their children from the kind of horrors of segregation. And, um, uh, a, a lot of my work as a 20th century historian is in oral history. So I did a lot of oral histories and I interviewed the people who were drivers, that would be my parents' generation, but I also interviewed the people in the back seat, that would be my generation, the kids, and found these very different stories. But every one of the kids, the back seat people, told me who well, our parents never told us. They didn't want to spoil. Um, to spoil us, to, to really tell us what those, the kind of horrors were of travel. So they didn't, they didn't talk about it. So we would go to North Carolina um, and, and spend a week there. And then coming back, we would repeat the same process, pack the car with food, blankets and pillows, never stop, gas up once um, and just drive straight through. And, and that was the experience for African-Americans traveling in the 50s and 60s. And even I discovered into the, into the early 1970s. Yeah, and it, 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 extraordinary stories. And I think shocking when I think the Mahalia Jackson um, material was so, so astonishing because what a brilliant artist and how she had to, I mean, can you describe a little bit about what her experience was? Well, the, the people who were traveling were, were performers, uh, baseball players. You know, they were the people that were really on the road a lot. And also the first generation of, of black executives for, for major corporations. But for people like Mahalia Jackson, who um, had to travel from gig to gig, they would um, 
they, they would perform in a, in a small town and they might perform for an all white audience, but there was no place in the town that would allow them to stay in a hotel. So they would then have to just get in the car and drive to their next gig. And um, she writes about being exhausted because she would have to sleep in her car or she would have to drive all night long to get to the next performance and then drive all night the next night to get to the next performance. And it was a, this grueling schedule. And she, she bought a Cadillac because, because she could afford a Cadillac and also because it was so comfortable. And if you have to sleep in your car, you want a comfortable car. And she talks about having to eat dried fruit you know, because there was no place for her to get a, get a meal. Um, so it was, it was really tough for African-Americans to travel, but I, I think it was also an act of defiance, you know, an act of protest that, you know, you may be trying to prevent us from traveling, but we are going to travel and we're gonna open up the, we're gonna open up the country and which is what they do. Right, and you talked about how it really um, helped fuel the civil rights movement, that mobility, which is a very important part of the book also. Absolutely. Well, it never really dawned on me before, but you couldn't have the civil rights movement without the car. If there weren't automobiles, you could not have had the civil rights movement the way it was, the way it existed. Because if, if you were going out to register voters in the South, you couldn't do it on foot. You had to have an automobile. You couldn't do it with a bus. You had to have an automobile. So people took these cars um, and they would drive around counties or drive around states and, and register voters. But they also took health care to voters. And they also took um, education to voters in, in these kind of rolling schools. So the, the automobile was very important. But think about the Montgomery bus boycott and the other boycotts in the South. In order to boycott the segregated buses, you absolutely had to have a fleet of cars. And so they, they would buy fleets of old cars and use those cars to drive people to work so that they didn't have to take the buses. And that's how they were able to bust the um, bus, the bus, uh, the segregated buses open. So the the automobile made an enormous difference for African Americans um, in the civil rights movement. They also allowed people to get from their ho from the airports to their hotels because the white uh, the cabs were segregated, and if you wanted to take a cab from the airport to your hotel you needed to go in a black cab. Well, you couldn't get a black cab at the airport, but you could get a rental car. And if you rented a car, then you could drive to your hotel. So rental cars also play this important role in civil rights. It was a, it was a tool, you know, it was a, it was a tool that they used um, to facilitate the movement. Yeah, and I, I think your book is, is, is so full of, um, it's a fascinating story and some of it is quite tragic and some of the images of, of sort of the racist signage along the roads is, is, is quite shocking. It, it's shocking and, um, and people have to get the book to see it. But it's also filled with joy. And I think I, I really loved the descriptions of in the Green Book, it was of places to stay would be among sort of bed and breakfasts like the rock rest, right? <laughs> can, you, exactly. can you tell people about what the rock rest was like and get to lobster? <laughs> rock rest was this absolutely fabulous tourist home in, um, in um, Maine, Kittery, Maine. And it was a place, you know, African-Americans had these, these resort communities all over the United States where they would go and you could decompress and you didn't have to worry about racism and you could just relax for a week or for two weeks. And Rock Rest actually was a, a place that I discovered, a, a colleague called me on a Wednesday night and he said, I found a, a, an African-American tourist home that's still intact, it's still perfect. Um, the family, when the family died, the son just closed the door and everything is still intact. And literally I got in the car with my husband and my young son at the time, <clears throat> we drove to Maine on fr that Friday night and here was Rock Rest. And it was this gorgeous little cottage that had um, a garage for, in, in case it rained, that was all outfitted with games and, and things to do. And it was just a place where you could get away from the, the 
you know, the daily grind of racism that African Americans experienced and stay with other like-minded African American families, you know, and I, I think these were places where people would meet marriage partners. They could, th this was, Rockwest was very middle-class. Their, their clientele was, was uh, pastors and teachers and physicians. Um, and, and they would get together every year. They would go back year after year after year um, just to enjoy the, the shore, the beach. Yeah, and I, I, I love the detail in your book how Sundays was Lobster Day and Lobster Thermidor was like, it's like we all would want to go there regardless of any color we are. I, I mean, the, yes, the, the, the cooking, the food, uh, so fantastic. And she made, she catered for the white community as well. So the lobster sounded wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. The, the book is fantastic. Um, thank you. And, and, and thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Dr. Gretchen Soren, her book, a uh, fascinating new book is Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Get it. Okay. Thank you. Finally, Charles Yu, the 30 second download. Charles Yu's books include the short story collections, Third Class Superhero and Sorry, Please, Thank You, and the novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. He's received the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award, been nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his work on the HBO series, Westworld. He's also written for shows on FX, AMC, Facebook Watch, and Adult Swim. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in, in The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic Wired Time and Plowshares, amongst others. His newest National Book Award winning novel is Interior Chinatown. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. Hello. It's good to see you. Well, okay. So, for those new to the book, can you unpack the title Interior <laughs> Chinatown? I yeah. Make it easy for myself. Interior Chinatown. <laughs> Go. Uh, okay, how long do I have? Uh... Go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, it's a play on words. Uh, it's, you know, in, for those unfamiliar with the screenwriting or screenplay format, before the scene, you have a slug line, which says, is this scene shot inside or outside? Um, and it's interior or exterior. So interior Chinatown is something that you could presumably write if you're writing a script about something set in Chinatown. Um, and it's also a way into the story which uh, takes place in a kind of psychological space. I'll say the protagonist of the story is Willis Wu. And he uh, is sort of a strange existence. Uh, he lives basically inside of a law and order episode is a good way to think of it. Um, and, but he does, he's not, a, he's not a character on Law and Order. He doesn't have a name. You know, he's the guy who you might see at the very end of the credits, generic Asian man, number three. And so that's Willis's life. Um, he, he lives inside this kind of fake Chinatown and he just wants to be part of the story. But he is, yes, a marginalized character, if you will. And I think that as you've said, kind of the front of the story is kind of, the waiter at the Golden Palace and the back of the story is an apartment building where all where many Asian people live and have lives. Um, so to unpack it a little bit further, so uh, you grew up, however, or yes, in Mar Vista, <laughs> California, mm -hmm. right? So um, so people was like, well, surely you grew up in Chinatown. That is not true, right? I, I believe that your mother, when you finished the, the book, your mother said, like, what do you know about China? Right? <laughs> yeah. Did I get that wrong? What did she no. say? No, that's what she said, uh, <laughs> which if you know her, that's pretty on brand. She, uh, she, she was right. I don't know anything about Chinatown or I didn't before, you know, I started writing the book and I, you know, in my defense or as I try to defend myself to my mom, uh, you know, I, I was like, mom, it doesn't, it's not it's not a real Chinatown. I mean, it's a kind of an amalgam of ideas about Chinatown. But, um, but yes, I, I did not grow up in Chinatown, nowhere near it. I grew up on the west side of LA, you know, in Mar Vista. And, uh, you know, Chinatown for us was maybe Monterey Park on the weekends, or maybe, you know, like the place in Torrance, where we'd go get, um, you know, like, 
Chinese food every week. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I really had to both do some research, but mostly construct my TV version of Chinatown, which is actually where the book takes place. Right, and I, I think it is, okay, so I'm gonna say the Praise National Book Award, that's not too shabby. Um, the praise for your book can feel so, so sort of meta and important. And then you start reading the book and it's totally fun to read. And I think that you, you talk about, you know, kind of like this, uh, and I'm half Chinese, a, a feeling kind of like a second rate oppression. And I, I when I was reading it, it's, it's so, it's so fun to read. And then there are moments in where I'm laughing and I go, can I laugh? Because it's so delicious and so fun. So I think it's almost like seeing through, and I think the, the beauty of it is it's really funny, but also really moving. So when you talk about the Law and Order episode, there's a, the big courtroom scene at the end. Uh, and it's something that you're intentionally playing with where we're sort of laughing, but also moved, maybe because we also grew up with television. I mean. Are you playing with that? Yeah, trying to, uh, trying to play with it. Uh, you, you're right that it, <laughs> it's funny I, when you say the, the outside maybe doesn't match the inside because it, it might seem, you know, like it's trying to tackle some serious subjects, but um, that's part of why, like anytime I try to tackle any subject, I end up getting tackled, you know, like I, I couldn't write this book for years. And it was because I, I was like trying to write a serious book. About, I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, oh, I'm going to write about immigration, assimilation, all these things. And I'm like, um, how do I do that? <laughs> like, I didn't know how to do it. And so I tried to put on my serious writer hat and it never worked. And the, the, when the writing actually started happening was when I started goofing off a little bit, to be honest. You know, I started saying, here's a voice that I'm interested in. And I'm going to have more fun and take myself less seriously. And then I think I ended up kind of veering back into where I wanted to be anyway. But, you know, it was a, a bit of like a, I guess that was the way I would try to check myself is whenever I felt like I was getting into the deep water, I would, you know, stop and say, mm, you know, like maybe go back a little bit, you know, like I don't, don't get in over your head. So I, I did try to have fun. I hope that it's fun for readers to experience because while it is talking about some serious things, I mean, there are, you know, parts of the book that are about, um, you know, uh, anti-Asian violence. There are parts of the book that are specific incidents in the, you know, the character stories that are hard, you know, were hard to write and maybe hard to read, but um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, yeah, I was trying to strike a balance, I think. Yeah, and you really take on some big topics. I mean, black and white, and you talk about Asians being kind of like this, we're not in the polarity, we, not in the polarity of black versus white. And so Asian oppression is, as you say, in a second, sort of a second rate oppression as the characters say, but everybody is stuck in this universe. All, and, and I think that's what's a fascinating read that I think it's relatable from all people. So, you know, the black character Miles is kind of like, you know, he's cool and that's kind of a <laughs> genre that he's stuck in. And I think also it was hilarious and the female actresses are stuck, you know, in their Navy pantsuits as kind of the hot DA. I think that that's what's sort of moving but also fun to read. Like all the actors are stuck in this universe. Yeah, exactly. And I think, um... Uh, it's, you know, that, that, that was a fun part to write. And it also helped um, do some of the heavy lifting for me. You know, the idea of like these stereotypes. Um, I think these are recognizable tropes at this point. You know, we're all, I, or I'll speak for myself. The one thing I'm really an expert on is watching TV. You know, like I, that's, I've, um, and uh, and so, yeah, Miles, as you mentioned, he's like an Ivy League graduate, was a banker, but, <laughs> but in the world of black and white, he's, you know, he's hyper masculine, cool guy, you know, um, and same with his partner, Sarah Green, you know, who she, she's a dimensional person, but in TV, she's um, hyper competent, you know, attractive, uh, blonde, white lady, you know, cop. So, um, 
so yes, it, it's it's kind of playing with all of these types that are at this point. Um, you know, hopefully we're past that on TV, but I don't know that we're fully past that. You know, there's 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 still plenty of that in TV to go around. Yeah, and I, I think that going back to Matthew Spector, F. Scott Fitzgerald writes novels, gets into TV. Well, it gets into Hollywood. You actually were on Westworld. And then the idea, sort of the novel almost came out of that in an interesting way. Um, and you've talked about sort of rhythm and emotion in terms of writing this book. What was your process like in your way finding your way to this form? Yeah, uh, process was awful. <laughs> I, I <laughs> listened to Matthew talk about how he's one of those writers who enjoys writing. And I was like, I am not one of those writers who enjoys writing. I am the other kind where, uh, you know, if I could do anything else, but, you know, it, it, um, it was painful. You know, I'm a slow writer. I have a tendency to confuse myself. And so I, I, as I mentioned, I, I was trying to write this a couple of different ways. I threw out whole versions of this book, you know, my long suffering agent editor had to read all these other versions that had like different titles, totally different ideas. And the process ended up being when I hit on this framework, it started to flow and it became a little bit of fun. You know, that, that, that was fun. It was fun for like two weeks and then it was hard again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think sometimes what I had to do in terms of rhythm is I had to look for, there's like an internal thing that's telling me, you know, like where to go next, you know, that I, I don't know exactly. It's like an intuition or a compass, I guess, of like, what's, what's interesting, what, what feels true basically about what, what are the characters going to do next. But I find that hard to sustain over many days. And so I'm like working in the day, you know, like a lot of people, I'm working a day job, which also happens to be writing at that point. And then I'm, you know, I have family and then I'd like sit down and I'm like, what was I doing? <laughs> and so I'd have to go back to the beginning and read. And so that that's kind of a big part of rhythm for me is feeling like, yeah, this, this is going together. You know, I've never written music, but I, that's my analogy is sort of like, is this, you know, does this follow from the last thing? And so I, I'd have to, that's why I think it, part of it, it took so long is, I almost had to hold it all in my head and that's like an impossible thing to do for the most part, so. Yeah, and I, I think, was it the voice of Willis? Was, was that, that was the moment that started when you knew what it was or when you started, right? Yeah, yeah, I, it, I, I have not had many moments like that, but that was the one where I'm like, oh, the character's talking to me. It, this is the only character that's ever actually talked to me. Everyone else, <laughs> everyone else, like I'm, you know, looking at the character on the page, like, come on, wake up, you know, but Willis actually, it sounds so mystical and weird. I, I'm not a believer in this until it happened, but I, I heard, you know, I was like, oh, I'm interested in that voice. And so it felt real right away. And I was like, I want to know what this guy's story is. So that, that really was a, an aha moment where I had fun with it for a while. And if I can ask, um, it's interesting because it makes so much sense. And my 20 year old daughter was reading it at the same time as me and, and she was totally understanding it. Uh, well, in the flow, she was relating to it. It felt fresh and relatable to her. So it's sort of around page 157 where Willis Wu's birth where suddenly you have a Henry James like sentence that takes up the whole page. So the rhythm and it totally makes sense of bursting into a new reality at that point. To what extent, and it feels very musical, whereas the short character descriptions early, it ex kind of explodes on that page. To what extent do you write it in the moment? Do you go back and look at it and put those pieces in? What's your process like to get there? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, and I hadn't thought of, you know, that's a really interesting juxtaposition you're making there of like these compressed, you know, almost like self-parodying descriptions that are, you know, throwaway lines that are meant to describe a whole human. And here's the opposite of it on page 157. Um, I, I think the process to get there is, um, it's, it's almost like that's the goal, you know? It's like, how do I get myself to a place where I can just start riffing, 
you know, and um, like I, I don't play an instrument really very well. I took piano and violin like a dutiful son, but I'm terrible at both. And but yeah, I want to get to that place where I, I'm I stopped like instead of thinking I have to do this, this and this, this is what this page is you know going for. And I'm now I'm writing with a different part of my brain, I think, or, or maybe just not my brain anymore, you know, my heart, I guess. And so I guess it's to loosen up. Sometimes it's when I'm tired, you know, sometimes it's when I'm a little hungover to be honest. You know what I mean? It's not always when I like, it's when my conscious mind isn't as alert and like <laughs> guarding the gate, you know, as, as with as much attention that the other part starts to go, Oh, here, here's my chance, you know? So. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, and, 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 and again, it's so relatable and, and sort of the congratulations, you are Kung Fu guy. Um, I think that, again, even if someone was not Asian or that they, there, there's something so universal about this, this book because everyone is a character, well, they feel like a character in a narrative or not. And, um, and, and I know that you are converting this into to the screen what's that and, and I, I know I shouldn't ask like but what's that process like um it's like a, a new fresh <laughs> torture uh, <laughs> which I feel terrible because like of course I am like over the moon you know the, the opportunity <laughs> it's what I asked for but it's like I already wrote this book and now I have to try to do this and I really wish I had been smart enough to step aside and have like a professional screenwriter, you know, like, I guess I do this for a living now, but someone else probably should have taken it. No, but I, it's been fun. It's, you know, I, I'm getting to write it for Hulu. Um, they've been incredibly supportive and it, it's really an exercise in like reinventing something, you know, saying, okay, this worked on, on the page, but that's not going to work in a different, in a visual medium. So how do you, do something that feels inspired by it, but isn't a literal translation. Because I think if I tried that, it just, it would never work. Right, and, and, and some of your um, scene descriptions, like in Fatty Choi's Chinatown Gambling Den, mm -hmm. um, everyone, men and women, young and old, looking sketchy, looking like they'll cut you for cheating or cut you for winning or just cut you if you look at them wrong. It's so fun to read almost Hemingway asking that and that scene description. So it's, it will be like interesting to see it come to screen because it's so fun reading this in, in screenplay format that you made in fiction and, and what will that be like? So well, thanks. fascinating. So, well, thank you so much. We, we can't wait for that and for your next book. And um, it, it's just really a fantastic read and congratulations. Thank you. So nice to talk to you. Thank you. Charles Yu, his latest National Book Award winning book is Interior Chinatown. Samantha and Eric. Well, Samantha, I'm sure is coming right now. I'll just jump in here. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Peterson. I edit the book section for the Southern California News Group. Uh, in this weekend's paper, we've got a great interview with Peter Heller talking about The Guide, his new novel. Uh, you won't want to miss that. He talks about fly fishing, a virus, danger, and climate change. Um, and if you like food, uh, we've got food writer George Geary talking about his latest book, Made in California. Uh, we've also got a collection of adventure-minded children's books uh, that will take you and someone you love on a trip. And coming up in the next few weeks, we've got an incredible interview with one of the most exciting and scary novelists around. We talked to uh, him about some very scary books, too. Uh, we've also got a very popular novelist, one of the most popular that you might not know, but your kid might. And we've also got an interview with, uh, speaking of older authors, an author who is over 90 and uh, with a great new book. So I just want to say once again for the print section uh, and the website, we, uh, we celebrate our local authors uh, and we're grateful for readers like you because we all contribute to the, the literary scene around here, uh, whether you're an author a reader, a bookseller, a librarian, a teacher, a journalist even. We're glad to have this time with you and I will give it back to Samantha. Thanks. Thank you, Amigo. Appreciate that so much. Um, and thank you, Sandra and Charlie and Alka and Gretchen and Matthew. 
Um, this was a great night. Uh, Bookish will be back September 17th with the Fonz himself, Henry Winkler, along with author Lynn Oliver. We've got Mary Roach and Daniel Handler, aka Lemony Snicket of the series of Unfortunate Events fame. Also, uh, come back September 3rd for our Get Frumpy Happy Hour with our columnist Marla Jo Fisher, and she's got special guest Dusty Sage, who is the author of the popular Disney blog Mouse Chat. Uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts from today or you have suggestions, please give us an email at events at scng.com. And don't forget, you can find um, all of our past episodes at scng.com forward slash virtual events. We'll see you next time. And thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Bye.